Hello to our Pleasant Green Church family and all of our listeners. This is Minister Leonard Harris, and we are here for our Sunday School lesson, uh, lesson number seven, for July 18, 2021. And this is out of Unit 2, entitled Faith and Salvation. And our lesson's title is Seeking Assurance. Seeking Assurance. Our devotional reading is from the book of Genesis, the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 6. And our background scripture is Romans, the fourth chapter. Our printed passage is also from Romans, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 12. And our key verse is Romans, the fourth chapter, and the third verse Uh, which reads, Abraham believed God, and it was credited or accounted to him as righteousness. Our lesson's aims are study the difference between faith and works as manifested in the life of Abraham. Reflect on the knowledge and wisdom of Paul as seen in his understanding of the Old Testament. And third, identify ways in which you rely on your faith for a relationship with God. Now, our lesson has three sections to it, or three parts. And the first section is Father of Faith. And that would be verses 1 through 3 out of the fourth chapter of Romans. Our second part is the facts of faith. And those would be verses 4 through 8 out of the fourth chapter of Romans. And then our last part or section of our lesson is footsteps of the faith. And those would be verses 9 through 12, also out of the fourth chapter of Romans. So we have the father of faith, the facts of faith, And then the footsteps of the faith. And again, this is a great lesson. Uh, It imparts uh, a lot for us to understand and to gather uh, and also to apply to our daily living. So as always, we would uh, like to ask the Lord to lead and guide us uh, in this lesson uh, that we would receive the things that God has already prepared uh, for us. So, Father, we ask that as we indulge ourselves in this lesson that you would impart to us the things you would have us to understand and to know and that you would strengthen us by the understanding that we would be examples and lights and be productive examples of your word, uh, that uh, people would see your light and your grace and mercy manifested in us and then be called unto you asking what also can they do that they may be called out of darkness into the light. And we thank you uh, before we begin our study for what we know 
we will receive as we indulge in our study. And we ask it all in the name of Christ, and for his sake we ask it. Amen. Now, our lesson starts with Paul, and he is writing uh, to the Christians. The text refers to them as the Jewish Christians in Rome uh, about uh, righteousness. And uh, many times Paul uh, was confronted by this uh, new establishment and this receptance or rejection from the people to whom Paul was sent. And we uh, know from the readings of Paul that Paul had quite a few uh, oppositions and uh, people whom did not agree with what Paul was teaching and also with what Paul was doing and to whom, to the people uh, to whom Paul was delivering the message. And this is just one of those instances where we uh, find the objection or rejection uh, to the message that was being delivered. And through a letter that Paul was sending to Rome, we uh, begin to unfold uh, some of the obstacles uh, that were in the path uh, as Paul began uh, his uh, missionary work uh, to deliver the message of God. And uh, we open up uh, our lesson uh, starts uh, with verses 1 uh, through 3. And Paul proposes this question uh, saying that uh, what shall we say then that Abraham our forefather according to the flesh discovered in this matter if in fact Abraham was justified by works he had something to boast about but not before God what does scripture say? Scripture tells us that Abraham believed God and it was accredited to him as righteousness or it was counted unto him for righteousness. And we receive this or as one of the outlines of the aims of our lesson uh, revealed to us uh, that uh, we should reflect on the knowledge and wisdom that Paul had in his understanding of the Old Testament. And so where it is cited and spoken that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness or credited to him as righteousness, uh, this we find in the 15th chapter of the book of Genesis. And at the beginning of the 15th chapter uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, towards the 6th verse is where we find uh, it written that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, many times uh, we are addressing a outcome of a um, situation where we are looking at uh, something that emerges out of other incidents or other 
situations that preceded the outcome that our focus is drawn to. And this would be a situation or a case uh, where this would actually be practice. Because when we read in the 15th chapter of Genesis, uh, we find here that uh, Abram, and it's interesting that uh, although we would refer to him as Abraham, but we find in the 15th chapter of Genesis that his name had not yet uh, been changed from Abram to Abraham. But what we see here is is that uh, the Lord appears unto Abram in a vision. And uh, Abram uh, has received a shield uh, for a great reward. Um, and what we... Uh, recognize here is that Abram here has been rewarded uh, by the Lord in a vision and uh, Abram recognizes uh, that he is in the favor of God and what precedes this in the 14th chapter of Genesis we find that Abram uh, had gone into Sodom and Gomorrah uh, to retrieve his brother Lot. And um, we, we find that there were battles that ensued and uh, Abram uh, was victorious in his battle, battles and he uh, was, was victorious in unseating some of the kings in this area and at the conclusion of the battle when he defeated the king of Sodom the king of Sodom asked Abram if he could have and this is in verse 21 of the 14th chapter uh, of uh, Genesis but he asked Abram if he could have his people now, uh, scripture prior to verse 21 tells us that uh, when Abram found out that Lot uh, had been taken was in Sodom and Gomorrah, that taken captive, that he took 318 of his trained servants and he went into the area to pursue the release of Lot and he was successful. And so, uh, we're, what we uh, realize here is, is that the king of Sodom was so impressed with the victorious valor of the uh, men uh, referred to as trained servants, 318, that uh, he perceived that if he had these men, that then he would also be victorious. So he asked Abram, uh, give me the persons, your servants, and take the goods for yourself. So he wanted to engage into trade with Abram. He wanted what he perceived as the power those that were willing to overtake him and his men. And in exchange, he told Abram, uh, you can have all of the goods and all the wealth that you choose. You can take that if you just give me your servants. But what Abram responded to him is, is that he had lifted his hand to the God, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. And he promised God that he would not take anything from Sodom and Gomorrah because he didn't want Sodom or Gomorrah to be able to say, he didn't want the king of that area to be able to say that Abram's wealth 
was obtained because Sodom had given their wealth to Abram. So Abram said he promised the Lord that he wouldn't take anything, uh, not even the straps on the sandals uh, from the uh, riches of Sodom. He said he wouldn't take anything because he didn't want Sodom, the king of Sodom, to be able to boast and say that, yes, of course, Abram has wealth. It is because we gave him that wealth. Abram said he wanted to rely only upon the possessor of heaven and earth, the most high God. And this proceeds coming into the 15th chapter of Genesis, where now Abram is asking God for the one thing that was laying heavy upon his heart. And he was saying that, hey, I have been rewarded with great reward, but I have no son to give this, to pass this on to. My inheritance goes to one who serves me in my house, but I want someone from my own loins. I want someone from myself to be able to be the heir of my inheritance. And this is where God uh, takes Abram and tells Abram to look toward the heavens and see if you can count the stars and be able to number them. And he said, so shall your descendants be. He was telling Abram that he was going to be the father of many the father of many nations, of many people. And while Abram's heart was heavy with wondering whom would he be able to leave his inheritance to, someone from his own bloodline, God was trying to tell him that I have chosen you to be the father of many. And just as you cannot count the number of stars there are in the heavens, so shall your seed be multiplied. And this leads us into the sixth verse, which says, And Abram believed in the Lord, and because he believed in the Lord, it was counted to him for righteousness. Now, it it should be noted and recognized here that uh, Abram he was not chosen or he was not blessed uh, because of uh, any works that he had performed one of the key factors in our lesson here is is Paul is trying to distinguish between uh, fleshly works and belief exemplified by faith the works of faith because of belief as being compared to those that uh, believe that uh, they receive things because of their works so Paul refers back to the Old Testament And speaks about how it was based upon Paul's example of his faith and his belief in God that he was blessed. Not because of any certain deeds or any certain acts that he had performed. And so as we go into our second part of our lesson and we begin to speak about the facts of faith. Now Paul indulges and brings us even closer into the distinction between works and then faith. And I would be reading from the NIV, but it it notes here that uh, Paul addresses it in this manner. And he says, now to the one who works, 
wages are not credited as a gift. Uh, the King James refers to it as the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And in the NIV it says, not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. So here we make the distinction about someone uh, who works and they work for wages. And because they receive compensation for what they do, that this is not often uh, received or not often acknowledged as grace or as a gift, but more or less because I did something. Uh, I rendered a service, therefore I should be compensated for that. And so you owe me a wage. You owe me a debt relative to the service that I performed. And so it is overlooked that the work that was performed was actually uh, a gift or actually done through the grace of God, it is more or less that now you're obligated to pay me for what I did. And that distinguishes us between being blessed to perform an act or service for God rather than being a person that is expecting a compensation for work that they perform. And so it tells us, it goes on and it says, however, to the one who does not work, but trust God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Let's read that again. However, to the one who does not work, but trust God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Now, we should distinguish between uh, work and being submissive to the will of God. There are certain things that are set aside, which were uh, we would say certain rudiments or fundamentals of the faith. And so if you performed these certain works, but well then it was considered that you are adhering to the requirements and the rudiments of the faith. But here it makes the distinction of, okay, how about those maybe they don't understand the rudiments and fundamentals of the faith, but still they trust in God and they perform certain works, even though they didn't realize that these were certain functions or requirements, or even if we would fix our lips to say prerequisites of the faith, but they do it out of the love and the compassion in their heart to do what is right in the sight of God. So then that is accredited to them as righteousness. Others do things by the letter, and because they perform certain things by the letter, they, they refer or identify themselves as being self-righteous because they've performed certain rudiments, fundamentals, and functions as listed as requirements in the faith. So their works are therefore self-justified because they followed the guidelines. Others do things without even knowing what the guidelines are. And these things are accredited to them as righteousness. It goes on and it tells us and it brings up uh, an example again here one of the points in our lesson was to uh, discuss or to describe how Paul uses his knowledge and wisdom of the Old Testament uh, and his understanding of that to reflect upon the issues of the day here Paul brings up another example 
and he describes David. And he said, David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness, blessedness of the one to whom God's credit credits righteousness apart from works. And then he brings up the 32nd number of Psalms, which reads, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now that really clarifies, that speaks clearly to what Paul was demonstrating in the preceding verses. Because here it says that the person that is blessed is the one whose transgressions, the one whose misfortunes are forgiven and they are not counted to them as a sin. It says the Lord does not impute iniquity, iniquity being the workers of evil or the workers that do not those things pleasant in the sight of God. It says the Lord does not impute, meaning that God did not ascribe or did not attach or did not attribute your transgressions and accounted them as sin. But it says in whose spirit there is no deceit. So God looks beyond the surface and looks at the inner person and realizes that their heart, in their heart, there is no deceit. In their heart, in their person, that they don't purposely seek out to harm and discredit others. And so when we look at the second part of our lesson, re relating back to the 32nd number of the book of Psalms, we see here that it is considered one is blessed if their transgressions are forgiven and their sin is covered. One is blessed if the Lord has not attached or ascribed or attribute their sins to them. One who God looks beneath the surface and sees that in their spirit there is no deceit. And that brings us to our closing section, which says the footsteps of the faith. And this is a crucial part here uh, because uh, it makes a contrast. It, it parallels a practice of the faith that was prevalent at this time that Paul is writing to Rome. It was prevalent at this time that those that were already, uh, many times we like to refer to people that are, uh, shall we say, they've been in the walk for a while. And we would like to address them as being seasoned saints or that they were uh, devout adherents uh, to the faith. Uh, sometimes uh, we find these persons, we find them attached to certain functions and rituals and rudiments of their practice, their faith. Here, Paul acknowledges this and then makes the distinction about how, irregardless of this practice, you hold so dear to your heart. Look at how the father of the faith that you profess, how the father was blessed and did not have these ritual and fundamental practice, which now you try and use to discredit others, to say that they are not worthy of the faith practice. So Paul addresses it in this manner, and he says 
if this blessedness only, let me rephrase that, is, not if, but is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Was this under what circumstances was it credited? Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. Now we read further in Genesis, in the 17th chapter of Genesis, is where God makes this covenant with Abraham. And then he uh, explains to Abraham about the practice of circumcision. But this was after he had already blessed Abraham with being the father of the faith. So he was not circumcised before he received the blessing. The blessing came prior to him being circumcised. So Paul lifts this here. And because an argument ensued during the time about people being blessed and in order to receive the uh, full Uh, reward of the faith they have to follow all of the fundamental rudiments of the faith therefore they must be circumcised Uh, and those uh, who uh, are students of the Bible and study remember that this was one of the obstacles this was one of the oppositions that Paul faced uh, bringing the new message to the people and so here Paul brings it up and says, uh, did he receive or was he credited with righteousness? Was this after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a sign of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. He had already demonstrated what God requires that your faith be based upon your belief in God. He had already demonstrated that he trusted God, but this was all done before the practice and before the institution of circumcision was even revealed to him. So then Paul says in the 11th verse, so then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. So even those that have not fulfilled certain rituals or rudiments or fundamentals of the faith, Abraham stands as an example saying that even if you have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might might be credited to you, you are still worthy that the righteousness may be accredited to you. All of the those that Uh, want to present to people who uh, are are not regular uh, practitioners of the faith Uh, and they want to establish a list of requirements. These are things you have to do. The first thing is, is the one who comes that is seeking the Lord. That's the first thing and the only thing that they must do in order to be welcomed in to the family of God is that they first just must seek the Lord. And it tells us in Hebrews that first you have to believe that God is 
and that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after the Lord. So as they come to the Lord, we should not be passing to them a list of requirements. Well, now you got to do this, and you got to do that, you got to do this, because it says that Abraham submitted and Abraham demonstrated by his faith walk with God, by the things he did be based on his belief that he already had submitted in his heart unto God without the religious requirements. So it, it explains to us today, we should not be running people away who are seeking the Lord based upon, have you done this? Have you done that? Well, first you're going to have to do this here. Well, now after you finish that, you got to do that. And then once you complete that, then you'll have to go through this program. And once you finish that, then uh, why, why, why do we place all of these obstacles in the way of those that are seeking God? So Paul uses the practice of circumcision to say that if God blessed Abraham to be the father of the faith and he had not fulfilled one of the rudiments that we hold so dearly now but yet demonstrated that he had the love of God so I want to uh, conclude uh, with this because it is another part of one of the uh, uh, aims of our lesson. It says, identify in which you rely on your faith for a relationship with God. Identify ways in which you rely on your faith. And I would like to end that out uh, with a very familiar passage. Uh, because uh, this uh, gives more credence to uh, how we establish uh, our relationship and reliance upon our faith. But Hebrews 11 uh, explains and says to us, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen as we are identifying ways in which we rely on our relationship through faith with God, uh, this would be a key point here. Uh, we are all familiar with 11 and 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. But I would like to read verse 3, because here it really lifts the substance of things that are hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Because in the third verse it says, but faith, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were made of things which are visible. Now it says, so that the things which are seen were not made, pardon me, the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. They were spoken into existence by the word of God. And here, where it explains to us is, is that uh, many times uh, faith is sometimes, unfortunately, related to things that we see, things tangible, things that we can touch. But true faith is when we go before the Lord and it is just the request between the two, between God and ourselves. And we don't intervene with anyone else. 
we only reveal to God what it is we're seeking. And even though it's not present, it's not right in front of me, I can't see it, I can't touch it, I can't smell it, but I've made a request. I have went before God with a petition. And even though I couldn't see it, the evidence of my faith is when it is brought before me. And so once one we realize here that the worlds were framed by the word of God, but this was done with things that were not seen. The things that God created, they were created from nothing. But the reality is, is that we see the power of God by the things that were created. And so even though we couldn't basically see it, it is the evidence of the things that are not seen. So we recognize that we serve a God that works from nothing, from zero, and from nothing creates everything. And that should be how we go before God, recognizing that nothing is impossible with God. With men, things are impossible, but with God, nothing is impossible. We certainly hope and pray that something that we discussed and something that we said uh, brought a greater understanding to us through the scriptures that uh, were lifted in this lesson. And most importantly, as always, uh, we pray that we would not just be hearers of God's word, but doers as well. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.